Rangan was Bhagwan's childhood friend. When uh, Rangan worked in Madras, he used to take a train and come to Thiruvannamalai. In one of his trips, when he came to Vilipuram, he missed the train from Vilipuram to Thiruvannamalai. He was totally distraught because the next train was hours after. So he approached the station master and the station master told him that uh, you can take a goods train to go to Thiruvannamalai. Good strain does not stop in uh, Thiruvannamalai. So, but in spite of that, he took the train. And when the train approached Thiruvannamalai, the driver slowed down so Rangan could jump off. So he jumped off and got injured in the process. He started limping towards the ashram. And the path was not very visible. And he had to scramble through the bushes and thorns and he hurt himself even more. So when he went to the ashram, Bhagavan saw him and asked him what happened. Ranga narrated the entire incident. Bhagavan asked him, why this haste? Rangan said, to see you. Bhagavan made all my troubles worthwhile by saying, the yearning for darshan matters more than the darshan itself. The common refrain is that, you know, he found me. And how did he find me? In a bookshop or in a friend's house or somewhere. And just that, that eyes, you know, just kept drawing me and drawing me till my mind got stilled. And, and then, they, then they start reading and then they say, no, they, we need to, uh, you know, enrich this presence. And then they uh, come to Arunachal and then, then they become like the prey in the tiger's mouth. In the 12th uh, paragraph of Nanya, Bhagavan says, just as what has been caught in the jaws of a tiger will not return. So those who have been caught in the look or the word even uses glance. So even a glance is enough.
in the Ramana Gita also, very often Muni makes a reference to this glance of Bhagavan. In this Muni says, Abhishicca Katakshena Maam Idam Vakyam Abhravit. Abhishicca Katakshena. The word he has used is, Muni has used is, he, he did Abhisheka for me with his glance. That word Abhishicca, Abhisheka speaks so much because it is it shows that it is cool because it's like water pouring on you and it is cleansing. Uh, you do Abhisheka normally to the idol, right? So it shows also the, the reverence which Bhagavan has for all beings. That because of the oneness, because he sees only the self. So in that glance, there is no looking down, looking at another. And that's why the glance is so, so beautiful. And there's another beautiful song by Sadhu Om Swami where he equates him to the tiger. Yenna Saida Doramana Unparvai. So, what did your glance do to me? He says, Yedumi the Indri and Nebirinye. Your glance has swallowed me completely. There is nothing remaining. And then he says, Pasupondra Parvai. He says, your glance is like that of a cow, very gentle. Okay. So gentle, so mild. Huh? Paramatma Vengai. But actually, it's the divine tiger. And Varam Nadi Vandor Siram Koyum Pangai Teriyad Nanum Tirumunnar Vanden. He says, it's a tiger like glance, which is bites of the head, the ego of those who come in front of it. Varam Nadi Vandor, you may come seeking the fulfillment of any desire, but that is going to finish you off, that glance. Without knowing it, I too came. I too came in front of you. Sindai meed pa indai jeevanai kaviye. You just pounced on my thinking and you finished off my life altogether. Mother Meenakshi had given her eyes to Bhagawan. Because Bhagawan, as a boy after self-realization, 15, 16, he went straight to Mother Meenakshi's shrine. For hours he used to be looking at Mother Meenakshi and all the time uh, tears would be flowing. Later when he was questioned by Brenton and others, he said, I was not emotional. I was not praying to Meenakshi, but Meenakshi's look led to something. Like that Bhagavan's look was Mother Meenakshi a must prasad for him. It's a silent look, powerful look. Bhagavan was asked also, what is the significance of Meenakshi? Meenakshi, fish look. The, there are three types of spiritual initiations in Vedanta by touch, by look, and by thinking. The fish, fish will uh, deliver hundreds of eggs, small eggs, unseeable eggs. And then from a distance, it will be looking at the eggs and they hatch. This is the Meenakshi mean these fish. That's why even in our kavyas, the heroine explained she had eyes like a fish, which is always given. Now it is not just the shape of the fish, eyes, people mistake it. The look, with that one look, they can uh, transform the uh, 
lover, <laughs> lover's heart. Sisters of ours, when the eyes of lovers merge in the act of seeing, of what use are spoken words that are not fashioned within the heart, so that no purpose will be served by the music of the spoken word with him who with his eyes brings us under his sway with Vankata Ramana, let us play Kanokam. One will be not looking at anyone. He will be generally gazing in the vacant space. In fact, even the Vedas say it is the gaze of the jnani. Uh, it is just like Tad Vishnuho Paramam Padam Sada Pashyanti Suraya. The sage is always beholding the supreme state of that all pervading truth in his heart. Diviva Chakshuratatam. But when you look at him, it is just like gazing in the space. He is not looking at anyone. It is just a vacant gaze. There is no personality in it. In the eyes, there is no eye. It is just infinity. It is just Akasha. So, he will not be generally looking. Devotees will be coming and going. Sometimes very big people will come. Sometimes animals will come, birds will come, everyone will come. But he will be just, uh, as another great Mahatma told, Prashanta Gambhira Nijaswabha. It's just the grandeur of that Gambhira. So he will not move. But sometimes the magic will happen. Some ripe soul will enter Bhagavan's presence. Then you will find this, this miracle. Kannodu kankachi Kannodu kankachi Kalakkum kaal kadalarul There's something about the eyeball to eyeball contact. Okay, there's some power that appears to be coming from one eye into another eye, but I, I would regard it more as completing a circuit. Um, Bhagavan always said, I'm not this form you see on the sofa in front of me. I am the unmanifest self inside you. So I think when he decides or when he, his eyes alight on your eyes, then somehow he is activating his own self inside you and causing you to become quiet, to become still. But because you naturally see the world the wrong way, you see him as something different, separate on his sofa, and you see him looking at you, giving you an intense look. And then as a result of that look, you have an intense experience. You think you attribute the experience to something moving eyeball to eyeball in a physical realm. But I think Bhagavan would say that what he was doing was simply being aware of himself inside you and making that peace, that presence inside you so tangible that your own mind stopped being excited by anything outside of itself and instead started looking towards the source, moving back to the source because that source was so infinitely better than what it was experiencing on the outside. And if, if you had the capacity to resist all your mental extroversions, you got pulled back into that silence and you became that silence. A 
अरुणाचल इज दक्षिणामूर्ति से भगवान भगवान रमणा इज दक्षिणामूर्ति से एवरीबडी हे इज द प्रसक्त टीच इज टू साइलेंस ध्यान श्लोका इट सेल्फ से ही हो गि डिस्कोर्स इज टू साइलेंस मौनों की आख्या एंड ही इज अ यंग मैन इज युवा लाइक भगवान वॉस वी के सिक्सटीन युवा all the seekers in front of him are aged mature ripe seekers sanaka sanandana sanatana tat kumara and shiva is sitting in silence south facing below the banyan tree and they attain self knowledge by his silence there is not even the talk the glance there it's a silence but there is a word then in our stotram नानाछिद्र घटोदर स्थित महादीप प्रभा चक्षुराधिकरण द्वारा फ्रॉम द आईज एंड अदर ऑर्गन भाई स्पंद डैम बर्स्ट इट जम्प्स आउट एंड से जाना इट्स स्टे इन दट आई नो आई एम अवेयर अवेयरनेस इज प्योर कॉन्शियसनेस that consciousness is coming to the eyes and that is reflected in all consciousness everywhere to that lakshana murti i offer my prostration so there is this uh, concept we have in tamil which is called a padal petra stalam you know where uh, temples of tamil nadu which have been sung of by the nalvar which is uh, upper sundarar thirunyana uh, sambandhar and manika vachakar those are called the padal petra stalams they have been sung of and we have bhagavan uh, whom we fondly call the padal petra peruman But so much has been written on him people like ramanatha brahmachari who is said to be very very silent and so unassuming you know but suddenly he was inspired to write about bhagwan and he wrote this beautiful song arule uruvaya marum ramanan marule dumila padam indannan indarnane pankaj amma was the lady devotee who wrote about bhagwan so many have written about bhagwan another old woman she was so old she was bent in double uh, we don't have a name for her but she would go round and round bhagwan even those days she would do pradakshina of bhagwan and at a point she would come very close to bhagwan and start singing songs on bhagwan which was completely extempore from her heart filled with love and devotion it had no great literally um, effect to it it could there could have been grammatical errors or there could be mismatch in rhyme and rhythm but it was poetry full of love and devotion that poured from her heart and in fact bhagwan himself at one point smiled and said that her poetry or her outpourings it were better than that of her sons who was himself a scholarly poet what what is interesting is that right from when he was 16 years old he seemed to have an innate knowledge 
of how to transmit. That, that's a bold claim and it's only based on one story that uh, we've got from Krishnamurti Iyer, I think. Apparently he was sitting in meditation and one of his friends said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just sitting in meditation. And he said, can you show me how to do it? And Bhagavan said, yes, sit down there, cross your legs. And he took a pencil out and put the blunt end of the pencil in, in the spot between the eyebrows. And apparently naturally, spontaneously transmitted so much energy that the boy totally freaked out and panicked. So th this, is, this is 16 before he's even left Majurai to come to Trivanamalai, that there was an innate knowledge that there was power in him and that under certain circumstances and by certain techniques, there was a possibility of putting this power into other people and giving them experiences. When he came as a 16 year old boy, when he had no food, anything in the Patali Linga, a dancing girl, she was giving her, him, even in the mouth. And sometimes, Bhagavan was in a high state, she will put the food into the mouth and close the mouth. Sometimes why it will be swallowed, so next day when she comes, it will be there. <laughs> so she will with her hand clear it off from the mouth, wash it by putting water. These are all beautiful stories, not stories, happening. And then again she will put and request, because Bhagavan is in Samadhi, request please swallow it. <laughs> In the dark, dank recesses of the underground linga, both of his thighs had wounds oozing blood, resulting from the onslaughts of insect bites. Mahan Seshadri Swami could immediately see the greatness of the young boy, and he instructed his disciple to carry this child out of the Patala Lingam and clean his wounds. He said, you already know that I am Amsha of Goddess Parvati Devi and the boy who is meditating is the Amsha of Lord Murga. Akhilandamma, we find her saying that, you know, he was so emaciated when she saw him in the uh, temple and she wanted to catch his glance but she, she he had his eyes closed then Her name was Akhilandamal. She was called as Desuramal because she came from a village called Desur. So she had first seen our Bhagavan in 1896 when Bhagavan was still in the Samadhi state and was not speaking or moving. But later, about seven years later, once when she was plucking some flowers at the foot of Arunachala, she saw a few people climb up the hill and she asked them where they were going. And they mentioned that they were going up the Banin tree cave and there was a young ascetic there who was not eating or was not speaking. And so they were in awe and they wanted to go and see this Swami. And so she followed them and she went there and she set eyes on Bhagavan. 
And although he had not bathed for several days, weeks, whatever it was, and was covered in dust, she saw a golden halo all around him. But his body had been reduced to just skeletons because he was not eating. And while she was watching him, he suddenly opened his eyes and set his gaze upon her. And that's the moment, was the guru disciple, the, the moment when grace fell on her and her heart just completely melted and she was filled with tears. And, she, and instantaneously, she surrendered to Bhagavan and vowed to serve him food. And from then on, she um, started bringing food and serving him. Other, since Bhagavan never ate alone, when he had people around him, he always shared whatever he got. So she's brought enough food for all of them. Until Ganapati Muni came, he was only communicated purely through his glance. But Ganapati Muni also had seen him earlier, but when the, in that momentous meeting, so 18th November, it was 1907. And the Muni came and he was a great tapasvi with a following and but he had this angst within him that he had not reached the ultimate experience and suddenly he remembered the one who was called Brahmana Swami on the hill and uh, he says he ran up to him though it was the midday uh, burning hot son of Arunachala who is as it is the Agni Lingam, the hill of fire, the but he went up and he surrendered to him and then he held his feet and he says he bathed his feet with his tears and he told him of his situation that whatever needs to be read, whatever needs to be practiced in earnest, whatever needs to be understood, it has all been done. But still he had to get the Guru Diksha and the Guru Kataksha. And from that moment onward, even then when Muni talks about that episode, he says that Bhagavan looked at him. First he looked at him for some time. Yes. And after that, yes, yeah. he says, yeah. He, says for 15 minutes, he, he just looked at him. Yeah. And after that, he spoke. And that uh, is the first time where it is publicly recorded that Bhagavan spoke and gave Upadesha and Muni could immediately intuit that this is not an ordinary sage and that the world needs to know him as Bhagavan because the name Ramana has a, a great spiritual significance. We find in Adhyatma Ramayana um, Vashishta while naming Rama, he says because he is Ramana, I am naming him Rama. Ramana means one in whom everyone revels, the self in whom everyone revels. Yes. And he immediately wrote that very day, he wrote to all his disciples yes. saying, I have found my Guru and he is not an ordinary Swami. I have christened him as Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi. You should call him this and may the whole world know him as such. So well, let's go back to 1911. Um, Frank Humphreys is uh, one of the first Westerners to come to Bhagawan. And what is fascinating is he's a assistant uh, superintendent of police. It's almost like uh, uh, the, the Raja of this place. But then he chose to come to Bhagawan after meeting Kavya Kanta Kanapadi Muni. And uh, Kavikanta specifically tells him to look at the Maharshi in his eyes and not to turn his gaze anywhere. For half an hour I looked at him in the eyes, which never changed their expression of deep contemplation. And I began to realize somewhat that the body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. I could only feel his body was not the man. It was the instrument of God merely a sitting motionless course from which God was radiating terrifically.
the most touching sight was the number of tiny children up to about seven years of age who climbed the hill all on their own to come and sit near the Maharshi. Even though he may not speak a word, nor even look at them for days together, they do not play but just sit there quietly in perfect contentment. Ramana Ulaynan Arigave Mudigadim Arid Arid Unnai Aridal When I was collecting information on Mastan to write a chapter for The Power of the Presence, I cast my net quite widely. And Veganeshan sent me a very interesting letter back. But he said that Viswanatha Swami had said that Bhagavan had told him, that's Bhagavan telling Viswanatha Swami, that Mastan Swami was the most advanced devotee he had ever encountered on the day of their first visit. So this is a a category of people of how close they were to the realization on the day of their first visit and he put Mastan as number one. Mastan was a Muslim weaver from a town called Desor which is about 40 kilometers from here. So he was friends with Akalandama who was uh, a lady, a child widow who used to come to Tiruvannamale and provide provisions for Bhagavan and the devotees at Virupaksha cave. They would walk from uh, Desor to Tiruvannamale, which was 40 kilometers each way. And Ak Akalandama would have a bundle of food on her head, which contained enough food to feed everyone at Virupaksha cave for three days. She obviously had a lot of devotion towards Bhagavan. She told Mastan um, how great Bhagavan was and Mastan was interested. So they, they set off, they walked the 40 kilometers to Tiruvannamale, arrived at the gate of Virupaksha cave. And I imagine the setup was very similar to it is today. There was an, a courtyard with an outer gate and you had to push open that gate, close it and then walk to the main entrance of the cave. Mastan Swami was a devout Muslim and this is how he describes the first darshan of Bhagwan. He was seated like a rock. His unswerving gaze was filled with grace, compassion and steady wisdom. I stood by his side. After giving me a look, he opened the gate of my heart and I was also established in his state in the very first encounter. Just one look from Bhagwan, and I stood like that for eight hours, absolutely without fatigue and filled with total absorption and peace. In those days at Virupaksha cave, Bhagwan would open our heart with a single gracious look and we would be transformed. There was no need for any questions since by his look, he made us like himself. Holy 
Bhagwan is often likened to Dakshina Murti and uh, that's the mode of transmission he preferred, obviously. I don't think he ever considered himself as anything. He had zero identification with any particular god. I, I think his devotees were always trying to pin labels on him and he was... Uh, he never bought into anyone's idea of who he was uh, and if he was asked about it he would just say, I, I am the self, I'm in the heart of all beings, that, that's who I am. Don't try and give me a form, don't give me a name. Uh, if it makes you happy, if it increases your devotion, that's fine. But don't assume that my silence on the matter is uh, acceding to your beliefs about who you think I am. Um, he, he did talk quite a bit about Dakshinamurti. He had a great uh, respect for the Dakshinamurti tradition. He said Dakshinamurti was the the primal guru in the sense that all guru lineages are descended from Dakshinamurti. He had a story that um, Murugana, who was extremely learned, called him on once. Bhagavan used to say that Dakshinamurti started off by answering the questions of the four sages who eventually brought to liberation. And after about a year, he got tired of answering all their questions. So he, he kept quiet and the, the silence turned out to be more powerful, more effective than the years of dialogue which he'd had with the four sages and they all realized the self through the power of his silence. And Murugana called him on this and said, I, I've read all the accounts, I've never heard this version before. And but Bhagavan, instead of citing a book, he said, I know, I know it's true. And Murugana decided that Bhagavan, Bhagavan had inside knowledge on this. He said it's not, it's not in any book, but, but somehow Bhagavan was involved in this, this scenario long, long ago and had direct knowledge of it. And we know Bhagwan's silence, uh, it could uh, bring peace, solace to HMI. When she came and wept, she had lost her husband and her, all her children within a span of one year. And she was inconsolable and she came to Bhagwan and she was weeping and he just looked at her. And he was silent but he just looked at her and all her pain dissolved. He was the first one who, who took a vow to feed Bhagwan every day. Like her, there was also Mudalayar party. When she became blind, some of them asked her, Hey, party, you know what you want to do? You don't know what you want to do. You do not know you have lost eyesight. You want to come to the hall and then see Bhagwan. Why do you daily insist and give us trouble? He said, hey, how does it matter whether I, I, I am able to see or not? Bhagavan will look at me. That is the darshan. Our great Rishi Marga's secret is in two words. Darshan and Sravana. Sravana is not hearing, transforming. My mother used to say, don't take him to be God or Guru or Swami, greatest ascetic, nothing. Just look at the eyes. He will look at you. The 
that linga should look at you. This is the secret of darshan. It is explained. Why do you look at your mirror? Because you can see yourself. That's why you go to the mirror. Actively it can. Every time the deity, the Maharishis have invented that, they should look at you. One samadhi. Many have questioned what is that magic? Outside it is not there, inside when you go, that power is there. That is not easily understandable to the intellect. That is his will, that's all. That is his will that the presence, the body, although disappeared, the presence is fully there. The initiating power is still fully there. So when people used to ask me whether you have seen Bhagavan. I used to say I can, I never felt that I have not seen him because the presence is fully there. But what is the presence does? It awakens the Atma Vichara. So, by the presence he makes you follow the teaching. In response to where people say, uh, are you teaching or you, uh, you know, why, why don't you travel everywhere? And uh, to, to, to say, and he said, how do you know that I'm not teaching? I would say even teaching is a, a limiting uh, thing because there has to be the triputi of the, the, the teaching, the teacher and the taught. Mm -hmm. Here it's only transmission. Bhagavan okay. Ramana came to not show how great he was or to establish a new religion, but he came to make us all Ramanas like him. No age, no caste, because everything is body based. And Bhagavan's look is beyond the body. You are Atma. Atma has no sex. Bhagavan is like this. When people were objecting to Bhagavan's mother, Samadhi being, a Jnani Samadhi. No, no, it is a lady body, and that also she is a she was a widow. <laughs> the whole of theoretical Hindus they were condemning. Bhagavan said to Jagdish Sastri, who was a communicator from Kanchimata, he said, Jagdish has Atma, the difference of sexes. This pure ether, that's why the Rigveda says Atma closest comes physically is Akash. Akash has no beginning, no end. Wind, water, fire, everything has a beginning and end. Akasha has no beginning, no end. It cannot be identified with color or a figure, nothing. Who has understood Akash? Bhagavan says, you, me, in between is Akash to me. Agatha Mari Malarmi Duri Aruna Chale Ramanan. Agatha Mari Malarmi Duri Aruna Chale Ramanan. Nagaita Nura Mirita Nagaita Nura Mirita Arache Hutan Yanadu Yere Megata Naru Surandan Yene Mugava Buri. Murugan Migatana Surandan Yene Mugavaburi Murugan 
Vishwanatha Swami, another great devotee of Bhagavan, he wrote a line, Muhava Puri Murugan. So, Ramanathapuram is the place where Muruganar was born. So, he just called him Muhava Puri Murugan. Then Bhagavan said, why don't you write a poem? Then he wrote, Ahattamarai Malarmiturai Arunachala Raman. Bhagavan himself completed the song. Nahaitan Uravitan Arashahitan and Aduhirai. This Bhagavan Nagetan means Bhagavan just laughed at him. Bhagavan very often used to make fun of Muruganar. Pura Viditan, just, just he opened his eyes and looked at him. Arashahitan and Aduhirai, he just killed me. He just effaced my ego, my Jeeva Bhava, my Ajnana was gone. Then that experience, that Purna Anubhuti came to him. And for expressing the gratitude, Jagattar Uye, for the sake of the world, so that the world will be benefited, Vahuttan Murai, he wrote this Sanidhi Murai, these songs on Bhagavan's grace. Jagattar Uye, Bhaguttan Murai, Tiruvajaka Nihare, it is just like Tiruvajaka, it is like Tiruvajaka, so that is the incident. Murugana was a Gandhian activist. Um, he was also a very good Tamil literary scholar. He had a, a great hunger for a guru who would show him the self. He, he wanted to be a devotee in the same way that Manikavachika was a devotee of Shiva a thousand years ago. Manikavachika was a great Tamil poet who took Shiva as his guru who gained liberation through, through Shiva's grace and who was then commissioned and ordered by Shiva to travel around Tamil Nadu singing songs of praise to all the, all the people of the Tamil regions. So somehow Murugana had decided that that's what he wanted for himself. He, he wanted this godlike guru who would grant him liberation but, but who would also be his muse. This poetry covers the teachings of Bhagavan from end to end and, and right from the first verse that he penned about Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi, which was very said, Shiva from Kailash has come. Like he came to listen to the songs of Manikka Vasagar in Perundurai, you O oh Lord Ramana Deshika, you have come to listen to the songs of this. He started like that when he came and met Bhagavan. He came with an offering of songs. He has written more than 30,000 verses around the life and teachings of Bhagavan. He came in 1923 for the first time with a poem he had written in the Arunachalaswara temple and when he stood in front of Bhagavan's hut and Bhagavan signaled for him to sing, he found he, he couldn't sing anymore. So although he'd spent years and years chanting his own verses, the moment he encountered Bhagavan he lost the ability to chant them. He had a very accelerated process of surrender and experience with Bhagavan. He found the liberating guru with Bhagavan, who he always took to be Shiva incarnate. 
And he also was encouraged by Bhagavan to compose verses in the style of Manikavachika, which was something else he wanted to do. was a governor from the first meeting. He says, he would see a bright effulgence. But that was accompanied by a fear. And the fear was that this man is going to eat me up. I am gone and I have a mother. I have a mother. If I get into this, who will take care of her? Who will take care of her? She was alone. So he, he gets caught up and ran. He didn't want to stay. And Bhagwan sent Kunju Swami and somebody else saying, go behind him. So apparently he went to Agni Tirtham. They caught up with him there and said, what happened? He said, no, 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 no. I wonder in one place he just burst out and said, there is a band, there is a group, a band of Siddhas here who are all robbers and they have got this fellow who is on top who, will, who is robbing everything from people and he ran away. This repeated. He again, he came. He couldn't keep away from Bhagavan. He would come to him. He would, ex he would experience this tremendous effulgence. He says the, the look of Bhagavan is like you put a wax in front of fire. The wax is gone. It will just melt completely. That was my state. Or like the ocean below the full moon. The ocean will swell. My heart was like that. Swelling, swelling. The full moon of his glance 
चलन में अब मुर्गनार सेड इन स्पोर्टिंग समय दैट भगवान हैड गिवन हिम हिज ओन स्टेट the the entire books of all the world cannot fill in the experience of murugnar with bhagwan this is just a brief glimpse of what happened to him when he was swallowed up whole by bhagwan one look pinnalum ba Murugnar was working in Chennai to support his family and he used to come often from Chennai to Tiruvannamalai to be with Bhagwan and it was always very very difficult for him to return from uh, from Bhagwan to Chennai uh, in fact when he had to do it uh, he used to walk backwards from the ashram to the railway station uh, with tears of ecstasy and uh, even when he reached the station he was roaming around he used to roam around the platform uh, and the train would come and go he would not even notice it when the porter or the station master told him that the train had left he would again rush back to ashram to be with bhagwan and when this started happening repeatedly bhagwan called kunju swami or vishnuadha swami and told him put him in the train and do not come back to ashram until the train leaves Murugan is always a bit vague about exactly when this happened with Bhagavan this final moment we we don't know when it was relative to his arrival in 23 i'm guessing probably within within a year maybe 18 months it's something that happened relatively quickly the best we can say is that it probably happened in palakottu that was the area adjacent to ramanashram where all the sadhus used to live in the 20s 30s 40s and in those days bhagavan would help with all the ashram chores and he suggested to murugana quite early in their association that they go to palakottu which was still quite heavily forested to collect leaves which they would dry out and later convert into leaf plates for the people in the ashram to eat off 
it was just an excuse. I don't think any leaf collecting ever got done. Bhagavan sat him down in a quiet corner of Palakotu, looked at him, and somehow in that moment, in that exchange, Murugana gained the full experience of the self. And some person wanted to do interview with Murugana Swami. He asked Swami, what sadhana you did? And Murugana said, sadhana? Bhagavan did not give me time even to close my eyes. Before that, the thing is over. So he just looked at me. And the experience, the Anubhava was transmitted. flow started to be very profuse in him and he took a vow that he would not write on any subject except Bhagavan, uh, his greatness, his gratitude towards him or his teachings and he kept that vow up for the rest of his life. Over the decades he wrote about 25,000 verses on that, on that topic. So starting in the mid-1920s he found in himself a great torrent of poetry coming out, which he said wasn't very volitional. Um, it would just spontaneously erupt from him. He would write things down on a piece of paper. Um, occasionally he would even write them down on a slate with chalk. And if nobody came along to copy it onto a piece of paper, when the next one spontaneously appeared in his head, he'd just w wipe it with his sleeve and that one would be gone forever. It's one of the uh, unending motifs of his poetry. He, he's endlessly grateful to Bhagavan and he can't stop writing, composing verses that explain the process through which Bhagavan looked at him or the teachings he gave him. So this particular section is called The Liberating Gaze of My Lord. My Lord not only pushed me into the heart with his gaze, he also pulled me while remaining there. He who is the ambrosial ocean of jnana swallowed me through his ambrosial jnana-filled look, making me become the expanse of transcendental swarupa, jnana. I became that ambrosia itself, attaining peace in the heart of my Lord. He is the transcendental light, the embodiment of supreme compassion. He is the Ishwara, the God who, 
taking pity on me, glanced at me with his unblinking gaze, enabling the Supreme to shine in my heart. He completely occupied the heart, leaving no vacant space, bestowing on me the life of grace. The Guru who abides as consciousness the Supreme bestowed his grace through his glance, penetrating my heart and transforming me into consciousness. Freed from the rising of the ego, the imaginary delusion, I became united with him as the one and only Swarupa. In the presence of him who reigned over me by revealing the perpetual state of liberation, I realized the life of grace, the mauna that never sets. What can one say of the great power of the look of this embodiment of compassion who caused the heart of this despairing one to become the expanse of supreme bliss? I resorted to you as my preceptor. Lord, bestowing your glance, you granted your true knowledge to this ignorant person who was wedded to the false, enabling me to obtain the ultimate goal in my heart and be redeemed. From now on, what could I possibly need? He, the embodiment of peace, is the ever blissful one. He is the thief who steals the hearts of devotees, remaining as the magnet of pure grace. He swallowed me through the powerful manifestation of peace. Through his mere glance, the Supreme will be attained. Lots more, thousands more if you want some more. <laughs> He's the embodiment of peace. incident also in the kitchen Bhagwan is to cut vegetables and Bhagwan will do everything perfect yoga karma sukhaushala very that such skillfulness will be there in his work so Muruganar also joined because he wanted to be with Bhagwan so he should do some work so he also joined in cutting vegetables but he had no idea he is not a dexterous worker so he was just putting things here, there, everything, just all chaos. After Bhagwan was speaking about some old incidents, then he looked at Muruganar and said, Are, uh, He says, what the work that you have performed, it is like your family life, because his family life was all confusion. So, he left everything. So, it is like that. Then Muruganar became very emotional. There also he wrote a song expressing, Bhagavan, I do not know how to run a good family life, but you know uh, to conduct everything perfectly. Why don't you get married? <laughs> yes. So that is, Nakarahi Nayandramanare Pukku Pichai Pulambitri Vadin Thakkavar Oru Thayaludaviyal Shikkana Kudivalkai Shalutthume. This is the song.
In early 1923, it was the first year that Raman Ashram had been founded. It was only a small coconut leaf hut at the base of the hill, uh, built around his mother's samadhi. Everyone assembled there, and by, by everyone I mean about seven people. This is a very small establishment in those days. On Shivaratri night, on Shivaratri the tradition is you stay up all night uh, engaging in various spiritual practices. You might do bhajans, japa, tell each other stories. So the people there had decided they were going to stay up all night in Bhagavan's presence, but they needed some kind of program, some kind of agenda to keep themselves awake all night. So someone suggested that Bhagavan start the ball rolling by telling the story of Dakshinamurti, which they thought was very appropriate for him because he esteemed Dakshinamurti and his methods so highly. So the request was put to Bhagavan, who didn't say a single word. Everyone was waiting for him to start telling a story or explain the significance of Dakshinamurti. And instead of talking about it, he just went into a very, very deep silence which everybody in that hut started to register and then they all realized he isn't talking about Dakshinamurti, he is being Dakshinamurti. Ramaswamy Pillai, who recorded this story, told me that they were out for about seven hours. He said there were seven people in that hut and between us we didn't have a single thought between 10 o'clock at night and 5 o'clock in the morning, at which point Bhagavan moved his attention a little bit and everybody's mind started started fizzing and bubbling up again. But Ramaswamy Pillai said that that, that was an extraordinary uh, fundamental demonstration of the true power of Anyani and what, what, he, what he can do if he's in the right mood. So that was Shiva Atri at Ramanashram 1923. <laughs> exactly 100 years ago. Yeah, oh, that's true, yeah. yeah. A third episode that I thought I'd share with you is from a South Indian devotee called T.K. Sundaresh Ayer, who came when he was young, even when Bhagavan was in the Rupaksha cave. Great devotee. And then one day he turned 36 years of age. So he says he wrote a poem in, in Tamil to be given to Bhagavan where he had put in a prayer, a plea, saying, I've been coming to you for a long time, Bhagavan. But I have not, I don't have, I don't know anything and I have not, I have not understood your real nature either. Can you please grant me by your grace? That which I should know. And I would like to know your your Sarupa, Bhagavan. So he gave this chit to Bhagavan and apparently Bhagavan looked at it and then turned his eyes on him. And then two hours happened. In that two hours, he says, my mind was gone in. So he says, Bhagavan asked him, what would you like to see? So he said, I told him, I am a devotee of Rama. If I can have a vision of Rama, my life will be fulfilled. Since immediately he says he had a vision of Rama, Sita, Lakshmana and Anuman. An indescribable. Only those who had a vision of God can probably understand. It must have been a some transcendental experience which he had. And then when he came to, he realized that two hours had elapsed. And then people told him that Bhagwan was looking at you. His eyes were new. Bhagwan asked him, what did you see? When he came out of it. He explained to him, I saw my Rama. Then Bhagwan said, get me that book, Dakshinamurti Ashtotram, 108 names of Shiva as Dakshinamurti. He flipped it and showed him the fifth last name. And the fifth last name, Nama was Yoga Patta Biramaya Namaha. 
prostrations to yoga patta bidama yoga patta bidama is rama sitting like dakshina murti like like that hands in chin mudra in word pose and he is exactly the same as dakshina murti bhagwan told you no difference between yoga rama and dakshina murti the same and ayodhya and arunachala are the same one of our um, kannada devotee poets he also describes bhagwan's glance in the context of the mysore maharaja coming and seeing bhagwan and then uh, there's this beautiful song where he says uh, my mind was running actually though i was wanting to come kadegu hidide odida nannana kadegu hidide odida nannana kadugure gara your mark never fails you you never fail your target but you how do you do your hunting kuli talliye hidi hidiva bari notadalle seleva he says you don't move go you don't you don't ride a horse for your hunting you just where you are and from there you capture and then you pull through your glance bari notadalle seleva yav modiyo maya gara this is i don't know what kind of fascination this is i don't know what kind of enticement this is enchantment this is you are a magician so that's the um, feelings which the maharaja has as he sees bhagwan and then he feels that okay now i'm free now i'm like a bird in the sky and i'm also like a child in the mother's lap so we can uh, we could recall the scene where the maharaja also you know wetted bhagwan's feet with his tears where he was given that very special darshan Difficult for a person to look at another person without moving his eyes, and when somebody is staring at you, it is difficult for you also to look back. So naturally, it will not happen because it is two personalities. It is very difficult. But in Bhagwan's case, Bhagwan is generally very shy. He will not that way personally look at a person. He will not make himself felt to another person. but when this phenomenon happens he will just look at that person completely focusing on him
விட்டு மற்பூயவான் கவடு விட்டு மண்ணுயிர் கண்ணோடு மற்பூயவான் கவடு விட்டு மண்ணுயிர் கண்ணோடு கற்பக கற்பக வேங்கடனோடு நாம் கண்ணோக்கம் ஆடாமோ கற்பக வேங்கடனோடு நாம் கண்ணோக்கம் ஆடாமோ Bhagavan Sai's are very ordinary. They are just the normal, not very big or sometimes you know like Swami Vivekananda, very big eyes. It was not like that. They were very ordinary. But suddenly those eyes, through those eyes, something infinite will come. And in that infinite there will be something very deeply personal. looking at you in ramayana i remember when vibhishana did sharanagati to rama almigi says uh, lochana abhyam pibanniva rama looked at him as if he will drink him through his eyes kannagi akkannil karumaniyai ammaniil kannagi அக்கண்ணில் கருமணியாய் அம்மணியில் பண்ணாத பாவையாய் பண்ணாத பாவையாய் பா தனைக்கும் வேராகும் நாகி மணியாய் இத்தனைக்கும் வேராகும் கண்ணாய ரமணனோடு கண்ணாய ரமணனோடு கண்ணோக்கம் Actually, Paul Brenton first time when Shankarashira told Paul Brenton to go and meet Ramana Maharshi. When he came and he had prepared 37 pages of questions to put the Maharshi and evening they had to go back to Velur. And when they entered into the Bhagavan's hall and Brenton looked at Bhagavan, Bhagavan looked back at him. he sat and sat
Paul Brunton said, insofar as the human eyes can mirror divine power, it is a fact that the sages do that. That's from A Search in Secret India, his most famous book about being here with Bhagwan. It is an ancient theory of mine that one can take the inventory of a man's soul from his eyes. But before those of the Mahashi, I hesitate, puzzled and baffled. The Mahashi turns and looks down into my face. I, in turn, gaze expectantly up at him. I become aware of a mysterious change taking place with great rapidity in my heart and mind. The dislikes, misunderstandings, coldnesses and selfishness which have marked my dealings with many of my fellows collapse into the abyss of nothingness. An untellable peace falls upon me and I know that there is nothing further that I shall ask from life. His eyes shine with astonishing brilliance. Strange sensations begin to arise in me. Those lustrous orbs seem to be peering into the inmost recesses of my soul. In a peculiar way, I feel aware of everything he can see in my heart. His mysterious glance penetrates my thoughts, my emotions and my desires. I am helpless before it. At first, this disconcerting gaze troubles me. I become vaguely uneasy. I feel that he has perceived pages that belong to a past that I have forgotten. Some curious intimation of future benefit forces me to endure that pitiless gaze. And so he continues to catch the feeble quality of my soul for a while. But I feel that he understands also what mind-devastating quest has impelled me to leave the common way and seek out such men as he. There comes a perceptible change in the telepathic current which plays between us, while my eyes blink frequently, but his remain without the least tremor. I become aware that he is definitely linking my own mind with his, that he is provoking my heart into that state of starry calm, which he seems to perpetually enjoy. In this extraordinary peace, I find a sense of exaltation and lightness. Time seems to stand still. My heart is released from its burden of care. In this beautiful entranced silence, when the clock stands still and the sorrows and errors of the past like trivialities, my mind is being submerged in that of the Mahashi, and wisdom is now at its perihelion. What is this man's gaze but a thaumaturgic wand which evokes a hidden world of unexpected splendour before my profane eyes? So this is such a, uh, you know, a Leela or divine play of Bhagawan, where in he uh, reaches out and silently, as he says, uh, words are the great uh, grandson of the source, the most powerful silence. And he says, if words can be so powerful, how powerful can that original source be? Sharamanamalai Bhagavan says, Malaradirandal Maunamidamo Arunachala. He is asking Arunachala, if the heart is not blossoming, is it a real maunam? It is not real maunam. It is a stoic silence. It is not real silence. It is just verbal silence. So when we say maunam, I have done some vichara on that because etymologically maunam does not mean silence. Maunam is the state of a jnani. Munehe bhava. It is the maunam. So whether the jnani speaks, whether he works, whether he does anything, even in war, as Krishna tells Arjuna, even in if you have to fight, then also the maunam will not go. So the maunam is the presence of the jnani. It is what we call as paravak. 
That is why Paul Brendan says it does not mean that sage is not speaking. He speaks, but his silence is more eloquent than his speech. He had this analogy of the silence being like uh, electricity in a wire. He said that's, that's the fundamental flow. In, in order to make it do some work, you have to interrupt it. You have to put some resistance in the wire and make it, for example, rotate a fan. He said the, the primal, primordial energy is the silence. But when you make it do some work, such as having the Nyani talk, then somehow you lose power, you lose effectiveness. The words may sound very good, but they don't have the same power as the silence. I think he knew that there were some people who had the capacity to tune in to the silence that he himself was experiencing and it didn't need any long complicated explanations, it didn't need any study, it didn't need any practice. All, all it needed was for you to be on the right wavelength, to have the right degree of receptivity and then you, you, you too could somehow fi find yourself in the same silence that he was always in. Bhagavan, uh, when he was in Pachayaman temple, you know, uh, sometimes the monkeys would come and sit in his presence and they would all be silent, totally silent. And uh, if any monkey started moving or fidgeting, uh, then he would speak, then Bhagavan would speak and he would say, hmm, what kingdom is getting stolen? What king, in the Rajyam Kolla Pordu? So, what kingdom is getting stolen that you want to move, you want to speak, you want to fidget, you want to do something? <laughs> I was in a, a Vipassana retreat in, in Pondicherry, in Oroville. And then when the retreat was finished, and I said, where else? Where else can I go? Ramana Maharshi's ashram is close by. I said, Ramana Maharshi Ashram is close by. I'm going. So I went there thinking I'd stay four days, and I stayed for four years. My first day I walked in the ashram, I just fell into deep peace. And my second day at the ashram, my heart and my whole, it felt like every pore in my body was filled with love. And I was in such a, in a deep state of peace. And I had no sense of Bhagwan having died. I, I did not miss the body at all. I was asking him questions and he was giving me answers to the questions. My meditations were very deep and profound. And there was no call to take me away. And then my third day here, Mrs. Osborne had told me about uh, one Vishwanatha Swami. And she said, he's a cousin of Ramana, which he was, and you might enjoy meeting him. So he, and he's at the back in the dispensary, which is no longer the dispensary. So I went up looking for him. And I looked in his room and I said, are you Vishwanatha Swami? And he nodded his head, didn't say a word, and then gestured. Come, come in, sit down on the bench. He was sitting on the bed very quietly, Emerson, chewing pan, just gazing. He looked at me, you may come in. I sat down and I said, I've got a question. 
I think it's a common question about Bhagwan's teachings. And he said, like that, didn't say a word, nodded. And I said, when Bhagwan says to inquire into who am I, does he make, mean to keep asking that question over and over again, or does he mean to take all your attention and focus it on just the sense of I? And he kept quiet. And then he looked at me and he said, Bhagwan's teaching, very softly, Bhagwan's teaching is one of the heart. And then he closed his eyes and went quiet. And the room was filled with the stillness. And I thought, oh, this is just like we read about with Bhagwan. And the, and the peace that I've been experience, experiencing since I came here. So I closed my eyes. And after about an hour, I opened my eyes and he was staring at me. And then he said, okay, you may go now. And he said, and you may come tomorrow at the same time, if you wish. And I said, I will be here. Those were the last words he spoke to me for three months. And after that, I went up on the hill to watch the sunset. And when I was sitting there, I felt completely at peace and completely at home. And I'd been in North India for five years. And um, I thought, wow, this is the India I've been looking for. This is it. This is it. I found a place to live. There weren't many places here then. This was in February 1976. I came to uh, Thiruvannamalai, 1970, to India. And then I started to pray to Bhagwan for guidance, for more guidance, for help. And um, I would fall into tears, looking at his picture, being in the ashram, mostly the old hall was where I was spending my time. I had never been a particularly devotional person. I was not a person who cried or, or prayed much or, or bowed down spontaneously. But sitting in that room, that's what was starting to happen. And the, the sense of presence of Ramana Maharshi so powerful, so powerful. And the ashram was very quiet in those days, too. Now it's a whole different thing. And so just this sense of Bhagwan never having died, just like he said, where can I go? I am here. And that is here till this very day. Bhagwan's presence is so strong. And his gaze, I, I look at his eyes, I look at the, one of these pictures, the Wellings bus, that they call the famous Wellings bus. I still look at that picture and it has the same impact on me that it did almost 50 years ago. <laughs> People commented on how hard it was to look down the lens into, into Bhagwan's face, what they were. It wasn't that he was thinking anything, it was just his presence that was so strong. And people these days wonder why people, Bhagwan was sitting on tiger skins, you know, because there are no tigers left virtually, but they were all the tiger skins, the three tiger skins were gifted. So this is the welling bust of Bhagwan, of Ramana. Gigi Welling came from Bangalore and took the most famous latter day pictures of Bhagwan. So that's where Bhagwan said, Is there enough light? And Welling said, Bhagwan, you are the light. Very potent. And I think that's why he was so patient with photographers. He must have known that this whole era of media was coming and that the, the pictures would be useful for people that 
weren't able to come and see him. came here I, I couldn't uh, get over the, the bliss that I was feeling that was on course. There was no physical guru here but wherever I went there was simply this uh, blissful state that was going on. I don't remember experience? whether I could sleep or anything but uh, there was, uh, it was April. It was extremely hot. There were only three other Westerners here. Two of them went off to see Papaji in the north. And I just said, I just can't go anywhere. Why, if I went somewhere else, what would I experience that I'm not experiencing here? You know, which was a, which was a death and a dying into, into bliss. So I just said, I can't go anywhere. I have to stay. to Tanjore, Tanjore uh, for my school studies and college studies. There I met one Mr. Dina Nathan, who was my school teacher. Then I came to know uh, he was the disciple of uh, Janaki Mata, who in turn is a disciple of Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi. She was essentially a householder, having a family and children. She got some spiritual experiences even before meeting Bhagwan, and developed some powers. She was levitating and all that, he, she didn't want it. She didn't want that way. And she didn't know what was happening to her. There was no guide. And, and one of the... Uh, uh, somebody appeared in her house uh, as a saint and gave Bhagwan's uh, photo, asked her to go to, uh, go to this person and he is your guru. She came to him uh, with, her, with her husband and started telling him that what are all happening to her as a spiritual uh, experiences. And she said she never wanted all that. What is supernatural power? Supernatural power she never wanted and she wants only uh, uh, liberation from birth death cycle. Bhagavan silently heard all that and was looking with his graceful eyes on her for some time. All, all that was pacified. Then she said, for the spiritual liberation, we need a guru. And you have been telling that you are not a guru. Then he, she, he gave that Upadesa Saram written in Malayalam. She was a Malayali lady, so in Malayalam, and gave it to her. Read, read to her all that. That was the Upadesa of her. So that is how she was taken as a uh, uh, disciple. disciple. Disciple in the usual way. She gave the Upadesa, read, read for her, made her repeat it. So it was all done. Then she became the... Uh, she took the surrender path to Bhagavan. Sharanagati. Sharanagati, full of Sharanagati. asked why he didn't go on a journey around India, a pilgrimage, and preach to people all over. And he said something like, but I can't see anything. So what many people think, and I think he was saying, was that he could only see the self. He couldn't see anything but the self. So what could he 
gain by traveling around and preaching to people. And then also he, of course, was chiefly in silence. We forget all that because we don't have that silence. It's like the it's like the paper, the plain paper between the words. The silence has to be there for the words to float on the top of. But uh, because he's not here, we tend to think of him as a person that was alive here in Ramanashram, here in Tiruvannamalai.
a colleague brought me to Thiruvannamalai for the first time and we did Girivalam. I had never, didn't know anything about Girivalam or Annamalayar or anything. So we did Girivalam and as we were passing the ashram at the gate, he asked me, do you want to go inside the ashram? And I told him, whose ashram? And he said, Ramana Bhagavan's ashram. I said, no, no. And I, we went to Annamalayar temple and then we went back. And this was in January 2011. In March 2011, I, have an, I had another colleague in Bangalore IBM. So she brought me here and we went into the ashram. And when I went into that, uh, in the, the, the new hall, where the big photo of Bhagavan is, and that's, that's all I remember. And after that, till this moment, I have breathed Bhagavan. Bhagavan has engulfed my life. And I didn't know his teachings. I didn't know anything about Bhagavan, but I had this immense adoration and love for Bhagavan. When I came into Bhagavan's presence, it was his grace, I guess, that um, that engulfed me. There was a moment of, um, I didn't know where I was. It was like a, uh, I cannot explain it. It is nothing, nothing specific to talk about, but there was definitely a moment of, uh, of blessing where I, um, I knew I was home. Without having read about his greatness or how he came to be, um, so that's that's how powerful Bhagavan's right. Sanadhi is. Uh, Mahatma said when you know when he heard of Ma, um, how much I loved Bhagavan, he said, perhaps you would have been in in a body form in the presence of Bhagavan. It could have been in the form of a monkey or even in the form of a louse on the head of a monkey. But there must have been a physical presence during Bhagavan's time for you to feel so much of one-pointed love and adoration for Bhagavan because I had not gone in search of a guru. There's nobody else, there's no conflict, no nothing. It was Bhagavan, it is Bhagavan and it will only be Bhagavan. So, so the, I felt happy to hear that because I used to anguish saying, oh, I wished I was there and during Bhagavan's time. And this gave me a lot of comfort that maybe I was there in some form, maybe a plant, something. Um, but yes, I, uh, Bhagavan is my breath. And I mean it a thousand percent. <laughs> Somebody wrote uh, an introduction to an ashram book and then gave it to him to be approved. And uh, the, in the introduction said, uh, Grace is flowing from Bhagavan's eyes. And Bhagavan took out his pen, crossed it out, and wrote, Grace is projected from Bhagavan's eyes. So de def definitely there was a sense of um, this person needs it right now. I would, I would look in that direction. But I'm hesitant to say that he was picking and choosing. I don't think there was a picker and a chooser inside Bhagavan. I think the hallmark of the Jnani is zero Sankalpa. I don't think that a Jnani thinks that you are in need of improvement or changing. So we are always projecting our um, world view onto him and attributing motives that make sense to us. He doesn't see us as ignorant, suffering, in need of improvement. He, he sees us as we really are the self. So he, he doesn't take pity on us, he doesn't have compassion towards us, uh, he doesn't even see us as separate from him. But by having that attitude, uh, an energy flow is created which somehow indirectly causes us to lose our suffering, to lose our sense of separation, but it's not something that's done directly by him. And he never saw at anyone as a sadhaka or a suffering person. Guruganar somewhere expresses, we would feel that Bhagwan will see our ignorance. It is just like uh, darkness wanted to have a vision of the sun. It can never. The moment sun comes, darkness goes. 
like that we will try to express our trouble to Bhagawan. But the moment we go before Bhagawan, our trouble will not be there. Because he looked at you as Purna. He always tried to convince you that you don't need anything. Unnai ni terinda yagil unaku or kedu mille. If you come to know yourself, then you will find that you are flawless, you are whole. But you, as you are asking me questions, I am answering you. This is Kaivalya Namani Itam, which Bhagavan used to quote very often. So, he looked at everyone as Purna, not only human being, but the birds, but the peacocks, the monkeys, the cows, everything. He never even imposed a sadhagatva, it's a sadhaga. He looked at everybody as same. Sometimes you call the monkeys as the greatest sannyasis. They are the true sannyas he used to not storing anything for tomorrow, keeping its own baby in its tummy. And when it comes, you drive it away and you keep all fruits inside the storeroom and lock it and keep the key here. Such a person is not a monk, but he is a monkey, monk with a key. <laughs> so that was Bhagavan's stance because the truth is always any food. There is no hour and all. There is nothing is covering. It is always more splendorous than the sun. Since I met Ramana Maharshi, my life changed from that time on. Um, when, when I met Punjaji, he asked me, well, all that time you were living in Tiruvannamalai, did you ever have any thought that it was possible that you could be liberated? And I said, every single day I felt what it is and that liberation is possible. And I say it to anyone who's watching, liberation is possible. Moksha is possible. It's possible. And come, when I've been doing the Buddhist meditation, I always felt it was possible, but it was meditate, 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 keep on meditating, keep on meditating. And then maybe one day, maybe one day. But when I came here, and sat in Bhagawan's presence and stayed at the ashram, I had no doubt, no doubt anymore that liberation is possible. And that liberation is here and now. And, and it's interesting because so many Buddhists, they talk about it over time, and yet when you look at Buddhist scriptures, the Buddhists, the Buddha used that term, liberation here and now. And that was Bhagwan's teaching. Bhagwan, people say that Bhagwan's main teaching was, who am I? That was his second teaching. His first teaching was, you are free, you are the self, here 
and now. It is nothing to be gained. It is who you already are. And when we get that inside of us, it leads to a whole different type of contentment in life. Even though we're still meditating, still putting the attention on the eye, it's not to gain something anymore because we already are the self. Oh, my God. 